we've got our last main talk of today, the first day, um, which is Mark from the BBC um, talking about um, achieving automation with mixed teams, mixed skills. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. okay so, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark, and basically, um, I lead the team at the BBC, which is a QA team, which is mainly responsible for testing the BBC's new support and weather websites. And the idea for the stock came about from some work we've been doing over the past year, year or so, whereby we've been trying to go from the point where we had literally no test automation in place to trying to make it an essential part of, of our process. And it's entitled Achieving Web Test Automation with a Mixed Skills Team, mainly because the biggest challenge that we had at the time uh, was that we had a team of really good testers, but they were manual testers. Okay, so they were really good people. They're, they're practically domain experts. Uh, but we had the problem, you know, how do we go from the kind of situation that we are now, having an automated testing suite in place uh, with, the, with this team. Um, so, so I think that the common perception within the, the industry is that test automation is mainly a technical problem, right? So a technical problem should be solved by technical people. And you know I'm guilty of this myself. So every time I've worked at other companies and I, I had the opportunity to build up a team myself from scratch, I've, I've always chosen to recruit one type of person. And then th that's this guy. So to me, that's the test engineer. And I knew you'd like this because you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming most of you are test engineers over here. And you know I really like test engineers because A, they can test, B, they can code, they understand how systems work. You can use them in code reviews. You know, they can do it all. So on a competence level, they're, you know, they're top. To a large extent, we consider them to be a superior form of test analyst. And then again, on a competence level, there is a solid argument behind that. So it's rather easy to take a, a software engineer and teach him how to test. But it's more difficult to take an analyst with no technical background and teach him how, how to code. Um, so I'm going to stereotype a bit here. Um, I'm going to be a bit unfair. I'm going to say there are two types of testers, the technical person and the analyst, right? And the main difference between those two people, in my opinion, besides their competences, is their motivation. So what makes me, as a test engineer, tick, what makes me get up in the morning and come to work is very different to, to the reason that the test analyst comes to work for. So, so I was amazed earlier when, when Michael was giving his talk, and all of a sudden, everyone burst out applauding in the middle of the talk. I've never seen that happen anywhere, right? And it was because he managed to solve this seemingly really complex problem in a very simple way. You know, and, and we were all amazed by this. There's a couch of, peop the couch of people sitting over there who are usually tapping at their laptops, and they just you know, smiled and looked at it and clapped. And the, the reason is that test engineers are usually motivated by the technical aspect of their work. So we're motivated by test harnesses, by, by what languages we're using, technologies, and so on. And so, so a typical example of this is a few years ago, I used to work at this company. And we were working on our flagship product at the time. And we were close to the, to the release date. And I, I turned to one of the engineers who, who, who was on my team. And he was a really talented person. And they asked him, listen, we need to build a user simulation. So could you please build an object which simulates uh, user behavior realistically? And then just you know, spawn it out over a number of threads. And, Simulate a realistic load and let's see how the system behaves over a number of days. You know, and what do you think his reaction was to this? So, so he was really happy about this. He went to his desk. He was really motivated about it. He, he built, I believe, a state transition, a state machine out of this. He, he has some probabilities to the transitions. You know, and then he built, you know, randomized behavior on this state machine. And he came up with this really realistic scenario, which ended up finding quite a bit of problems for us. And, and hence, it was a, a successful assignment for him. And you know that's one motivated engineer. A few weeks later, we were working on another project. And this time, it was, it was a financial system, which, you know, to cut a long story short, takes a large XML file, processes it, saves some values in the database, and then produces some form of output. And because, because we were mainly, because people were getting paid as a result of this, as a result of this the, this application, you know, we needed to cover all our bases. We need to get it right. 
So I said, okay, so this person did a really good job last time around, you know, let's depend on him this time. And I, I assigned him this task. I told him, listen, this is the schema that the system will, will process. Could you please, you know, take, take it away with you and come up with a comprehensive list of test cases that makes sure we cover all our cases, all our, all our bases. And, you know, I was surprised when his, turn, his face turned to this. You know, and he, he didn't really like this. He did it anyway. But the task which I thought should take maybe a day, maybe two, wasn't ready at the, at the end of the fourth day. As this, this person began to pro procrastinate, he became really altruistic. So as soon as someone had a tec technical problem, he just volunteered to help them out. No, and it was incredible. Great for team spirit, but not for this particular task. And at the end of this fourth day, I said, OK, I mean, let's do this together. We locked ourselves in a meeting room and the whiteboard and just got it done. And you know, at the end of this, he went away. He automated the test, so he was happy with that. And the problem here was not that he was not capable of doing it, so he had the competence to do it. But the problem was that it didn't really make him tick. So the analysis task wasn't something he enjoyed doing. And he also appreciated that the fact that he did this task uh, really helped him, helped him do a really good job of the automation work after that. So in general, what you end up getting is a situation like this. So imagine you, you can you line up a list of testing tasks from left to right, from least technical to most technical. And this is not based on any scientific survey. This is just from experience and talking to people. And on, on the y-axis, you plot you know, motivation. So how happy am I doing this task? And if you're a test analyst, and again, I'm stereotyping a lot here, chances are that you'll be really motivated to do the task on the left side of the graph. It's process auditing, test reporting, manual test execution, uh, following up on bugs, and so on. But then when you get to the, to the right side of the graph, even if you do have a technical background, but for, for whatever reason you're stuck to, to the analysis side of the, the industry, you know, you're not really motivated to do this. So the quality of your work, your work might suffer. Uh, if you look at engineers, which is the red line, you tend to, to get the, the reverse, right? So, so you're really motivated with user simulations, performance tests, and, and all this stuff. But then, you know, Ask, some, ask a test engineer to write a report, and I've seen this happen. And you know, I had this guy once who literally pulled off an all-nighter at work to write a tool which wrote the report for him. And it, it just signifies this. Sorry? Yeah. It just signifies that sort of, you know, it's, it's what makes the person tick at the end of the day. So the scope of, of this talk is, you know, we, got, we were forced in the situation because of the team that we had. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could bring in some engineering talent in the team, but hold on to the team that we have now, and sort of have a situation whereby we have this. So where you could somehow merge all the, merge the skills of, of all the people involved and, get, and achieve the, you know, a high level of motivation throughout. So actually, the scope of the stock is even narrower than that. So how do we bring in the people on the left side of the graph, the analysts, into the automation side of things? No, and that's, that's what the stock is about. Um, okay, so just to put you in a bit of context, so this is one of the earlier versions of, of our news website. It's December 12, 1998. President Clinton was being impeached, and basically the site has a very 1990s feel to it. It seems to be optimized to 800 by 600, which was the predominant resolution at the time. And, you know, uh, basically there isn't much, much that's impressive about it. It's a static web page. And what happened over the years is that, you know, the site changed. So as, as, the, as time went by, you know, broadband became popular and we want to take advantage of that. Uh, new technologies came about which gave us new, new, new possibilities. And, you know, we have a team of engineers who is really proactive in these things. And today we're in a situation where, where we have a site which is, you know, basically very different to the, to the one from 12 years ago. Actually, there's a piece of work going on right now. We're relaunching the site sometime next year, which is going to look completely different again. And the only, the only thing that's common over here is that politicians are still stepping down from their jobs, basically. And so, so the site is now very AV-centric. So we actually, if you live in the UK, you can view the, your television channels online in, in high quality. Uh, we actually syndicate our content out to external sites. Uh, we also cover sport events live. So, so this is an example where, where we use our iPlayer component to actually cover Formula One in the UK. And we, we allow users to use 
to switch between camera views, between different audio commentaries. Uh, so the site is becoming more dynamic. And below this comp component, there would be more dynamic components, so the leaderboard would be changing as the race, race goes on dynamically. Uh, journalists would be updating it with their, updating their comments online. Users can text in their comments, and we actually have user participation. So, so the site keeps changing. Um, this is another service which we're launching in the next few weeks for anyone who's interested in politics. So basically, this is a project which links up all the parliaments in the UK, as well as the European Parliament. And basically, there's a live stream going on at any one point. And you can also view recorded sessions if you wanted to. Uh, there's also some innovative new features, like, for example, you might want to search, you know, when did Gordon Brown speak about recession? And we would literally give you all the video clips where Gordon Brown mentioned the word recessions and take you to the point where, where he mentioned the word recession and so on. So, so the site has evolved from that static site, which I showed you, I showed you earlier on, to, to these, this rich set of, set of services, basically, which is great. But from a testing perspective, it's, it's a nightmare. Okay, so, so what's actually been happening is, and, and I'll get into this a bit later, when we, start up, when we start a new project, what we tend to do is we tend to set up a cross-functional project team. Okay? So we have a number of engineers on this project team, and usually they're specialists. So let's say last year we covered the American election, and we have an engineer who, who's, who's an expert in feeds because we're processing election results. We have someone who's an expert in AV because we want to stream the victory speeches live. We have someone who's interested in publishing. So we get these specialist engineers, and they're really good. And we usually have one tester, maybe two, to cater to, to this particular project. And so far, they've always been manual testers. So in the case of this, um, so, so in the context of the SOC, obviously we need to keep in mind that we want to automate this testing now. Uh, we also have user experience designers who make sure we, we stick to the identity of the site, product managers who, who decide what stays in or stays out, project managers who make sure we deliver this on time. And, who have these, these group of magic people, I call them, who I call them formation architects. And I, know, I don't know whether you've had the opportunity to work with these people, but you know, if you have the money for them, go out and hire them, because they're really good. What, what information architects tend to do is, so they're usually graduates of library science, and they specialize in how information is, is structured, basically. So if you take the example of, of a website and three different people looking at this website, um, Let's say you have an engineer, a designer, and a, a product manager. So if you're an engineer and you, you're looking at this page, you're probably visualizing HTML code, maybe Java code, which is generating that, that page, and so on. If you're, if, you're, if you're a designer, you're probably thinking in terms of colors, fonts, CSS classes, and so on as well. And if you're a product manager, you're thinking of it in terms of features. So there's a link to a live stream, there's a top story, there's a new sticker and so on. So it's not uncommon for us as testers to talk to three different people about the same system and get a completely different set of terminology. Because people are, are looking at the system in, from their own point of views, and they're discussing it with their own peers in, in their own languages. And what information architects do is they, they first of all, give everyone a common language. Okay? And they do things like organize your site into a content object model. They create user journeys. And, and this is all, all work, which can map directly to test automation at the end of the day. So we found these people really, really helpful. Another thing that's happened over the years is that because these teams are empowered to just make their own decisions and come up with the best solution that they can, we've had a situation where people are, are basically uh, making technology choices and using any technology that comes along at the time, which is best for the job. So we're currently in a situation, and, and trust me, this is a subset of all the technologies that we have. So we have publishers written in Java right now. Uh, we have um, journalist tools written in .NET. We have AV content written in Flash. Some other dynamic um, aspects written in JavaScript. Our weather site is a PHP site. You know, so trying to achieve this okay, with, with the current team that we have, with this set of technologies, was a bit of a problem. Okay, so so this, is, this is a situation we found ourselves in. Um, Okay, so we started off about a year ago with this from, from the point of having no automation. We said, okay, so where do we start? And the first thing we have to do is make a decision, you know, what projects can, can we automate first, which one will give us the most value. And this might sound trivial, but what we did was we put together a very short questionnaire 
basically it was a list of statements, a more tense statements. And the statement said things like the site, sorry, this project will keep delivering releases regularly at least for the next six months. Or on this project, I usually spend most of my time regression testing instead of testing new features. And we asked two people for each project to answer these questions. And they answered them by giving a value between 0 and 5, where 0 means no, that's completely not true, and 5 means, you know, that's very relevant, it's very true. And then we sort of got together, moderated these scores, and came up with a, with a, with a scoring system. And we were working on 13 concurrent projects at the time, and basically the top two projects were the WCW, which was our weather site at the time, which scored highly, mainly because it was not released yet, we knew it would go on for roughly a period of two years after it was released. And we we're planning a lot of releases, plus we were spending a lot of time regression testing. So that scored really highly. Uh, the second project was Project Toggle, which is basically a mechanism which decides how, how users are directed throughout the site, depending on their geographical location in the world uh, and some other parameters. And then on the lower end of the scale, we had projects like picture galleries. This was in the context of the, the US selections whereby we were coming up with a new component, which we know we knew we would only create once and then reuse over and over again. And so we didn't really want to automate it. At the end of the day, we ended up doing our first automation project on, on our mobile browser, which basically w was a rewrite of, of our mobile production code. And we chose that project because it was going through, through a number of releases at the time, and each release was taking up to two weeks to test. And you know, this put the project in a bit of trouble time-wise, so we chose that at the end of the day. Um, so once we choose a project, what we do is, again, something which sounds really trivial, we get together a room and we define success for this project. So once we're done, once this project is finished, what does success look like? Look, sorry, what does success look like? And this might be anything from, you know, we'll have increased viewership numbers, all the way down to, you know, we'll have zero cost regression testing. And we also define failure. So we, we know what failure looks like. So if someone is watching the World Cup online and all of a sudden during the final penalty kickoff, you know, everything hangs, you know, that's a disaster for us. Next time around, people are not likely to use our site. And the, the reason we do this, even though it sounds trivial, is because it has this amazing effect of focusing everyone on where we want, where we want to go. And, and, and that's really important for us. So you can move towards success and you start smelling failure because you've already defined it, you know, you can take corrective action. Um, so most of the, the audience here are test engineers, so I'll start getting into some technical details. So one of the early things we knew we, we wanted to carry out was we wanted to, to utilize abstraction as much as, as much as possible. And we, we wanted to utilize abstraction mainly because of the, the kind of skills we had in the team. And if you build in the right level of abstraction into your technology stack, then you're more likely to pull non-technical people into the, the automation side of things. And our first concept of this, our first tab at it was this. Okay? It's, we haven't really gotten there yet. In fact, this has actually changed today. But we, we had this vision of having a situation whereby we'd have a lower layer, whereby engineers would be working in, in core languages like C Sharp, Ruby, Java, so on. And using these libraries, they, using these languages, they'd build up foundation test libraries. So we'd go to them and say, OK, we need a data factory. We need to be able to create stories on the fly. Okay, how do we do that? And they build up APIs for us. And eventually, once we had a critical mass of these APIs, we hope to harvest, harvest a DSL from this. And at the point that you have a DSL, you can actually bring in non-technical people who can actually create their, their tests in plain English. So that was the vision at the time. And then once you have you know, this mass of people creating tests, you can create testing tools, regression suites. And at the highest level, you know, you'll have stakeholders having a, a look at bug count, trends, and so on. So as I, as I said, we're not really there yet. This has actually changed, and I'll get into it a bit later. And we've been doing a lot of work in the bottom three layers, mainly. The third action we wanted to take was to unify technologies. So given the situation that we were in, we wanted to take this situation Okay, which is where, where we had developers and different teams working in different technologies. And somehow on the testing side, unify this under one technology. Okay, this made it easier for, to train up people, made it, made it easier to bring in people who are not really that comfortable coding. Okay, so 
the idea was that from a testing perspective, you, you'd always do something, you, you'd always write testing scripts in, in one language. And what we did was we took this set of technologies and just added another one into the mix just for the fun of it, and we chose Ruby, okay? And I come from a Java background, and this was a painful decision for me. But I accepted it, and I accepted it for three reasons. So the first one was that, you know, from, from the research that we did, Ruby has a rather, doesn't have a really steep learning curve. So we actually got to send the whole team away to a training course, and they came back, and they were relatively comfortable with doing some basic Ruby code. Uh, the second one is Ruby syntax is very loose. Okay, so, so again, this sounds trivial, but it helps. And you, you could call methods and pass in parameters without including brackets, for example. And you know, to you that might sound, might sound, might sound trivial, but to someone who's not really comfortable with code, saying create space story is easier than saying create open bracket story, close bracket, semicolon. You know? so, so we thought that would help in the creation of the ESL. And thirdly, since Ruby is, a, is an interpreted language, we knew that there were interpreters out there which could talk to the other languages in, in the stack over here. Okay, so, so right now we're doing some .NET testing. We're writing it in Ruby, but we're, we're using the, the I in Ruby interpreter, which actually talks to .NET code. So we wanted to access developer classes, either be it to check state, or maybe want to use their DAOs to generate test data or create data factories. We can through it, do it through Ruby. So the effect this had at the end of the day was that uh, this, this layer, layering model over here, right now it's, it's this. Okay, so we're using a technology called Cucumber. I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, so I'll get into it in, in a few minutes. And basically at the, at the very bottom, right now we're testing two types of applications. So there, web, there are websites and there are .NET applications which, which journalists use to actually upload stories to the site. So we're using Selenium Grid to, to test web output, and we're using an API called White. It's an open source API from, from ThoughtWorks. And very loosely speaking, White is, is like Selenium for, for Windows applications. It's not as well supported. We've had to do a lot of digging around to get to know it, uh, but, but it's doing a job for us, it's doing the job. So, so we'll go into Cucumber for, for a few minutes and just explain why we chose this, this language. So, this layering model over here, if you, if you look at Cucumber, that particular, that's equivalent to the BSL level right now. Okay, so, so you're, lo you're actually looking at the, at the bottom three, three levels of, of our abstraction stack. So for those of you who are not familiar with Cucumber, basically it comes from the camp of behavior-driven development, which seems to be gaining popularity recently. And it basically allows you to, to create executable tests in plain English. Okay, so here we have a simple example which is of a test which is tagged as a smoke test and tagged as an additions test. And so what you do is first you define a scenario in free text and you say, okay, so I'm gonna test a scenario where we have an international user who's accessing the, the news website. And Cucumber comes with a limited number of, of keywords, basically there's given, when, then, and, and, and a few more. And basically, you say, okay, given I am a user outside the UK, when I visit the news website, then I should be redirected to the international edition, and I should see adverts on the page. Okay, and, and this will turn out to be an executable test at the end of the day. So Cucumber will actually run this test, and it has this, this reporting facility which shows all these steps, and you know, if the test passed, the, the step is in green, and if not, it's in red. And what this gives us is, it gives us a number of benefits. So first of all, it gives us amazing visibility. Okay, so, so outside the engineering team, we have the project managers, we have the product managers, and when they come to us and ask us for status, or when they come to us and ask us, you know, what, what sort of testing are you carrying out, you know, we can show them this. And we, we can actually have non-technical people, such as product managers, going through this, signing them off. The second advantage it gives us is we can bring in test analysts who are not really comfortable coding but they are comfortable writing test scripts. And all that's actually happening is that instead of writing them out in, in Microsoft Word or in any third party tool, um, they're just writing it out in Cucumber for all, right? And eventually this will turn into an automated test. The other thing which, which helps us out here is that, so when I said 
software engineers are motivated by technology, analysts tend to be motivated by, by, by organizing, by planning, by strategizing, and those sorts of activities. So th there's a really important activity here, which, which kind of scared me initially when we were getting into this technology. If you, if you look at the, if, if you take English as a language, and let's take an example, there's a line which says, when I visit the news website. There are dozens of different ways you could say that, right? So if you have 10, 10 testers working and they're all writing the, the same thing semantically, syntactically they might say, when I visit the news website, when I navigate to the news website, when I go to the BBC news website. So, so there are dozens of ways you could say this. And so we actually have analysts who actually take ownership of this, and it's something they enjoy doing, and they can say, okay, so, you know, if you want to carry out this semantic task, this is how you say it. Okay, and they take ownership of it, which is great. So eventually, this must turn into executable code, right? And the way Cucumber works is it uses a mechanism of regular expressions, and you have something like given, and then you, you build a regular expression. Given I am a user outside UK, for example, as soon as Cucumber encounters that, it looks for it in its roots file and say, okay, what should I do now? What does this mean? And after a number of examples, we found that people without technical background can actually create this file. And what's more, they'll actually enjoy doing it. And they'll enjoy doing it not because it's a technical thing to do, but because it gives them a mechanism by which they can control the vocabulary and control what things mean. Okay, so, so after a number of examples, the, this, side of, this side of the automated testing is now handled by non-technical people completely. So, so they, they fill in these regular expressions. Sometimes you have to re rework them because it can get more complex than this, right? So you can have wild cards in there and you can have some complex logic. Okay, so engineers might look at this later and change it around a bit. But they'll actually fill this in, put in those pending keywords, and those pending keywords show up in a report at some point, and an engineer will just go in and wire things into the actual site. And that might look something like this. Okay, so given I am a user outside the UK, now do, and you talk to a helpers object, and you say set proxy to international. And that, that just says that, you know, use a Selenium instance, which is going through an international proxy. And so again, at this point, we're starting to drift towards, towards more coding style. So we're trying to drift, starting to drift into engineering territory. And this would be a good point to bring in page objects. So at this point so far, I'm just going to go back a few slides. We've been at the top layer, right? So we've been at the cucumber level. And page objects or a technique which I learned at GTAC, surprisingly enough, from Simon Stewart in 2007 when he was introducing WebDriver. And basically all page objects do is they, they act as an interface between your tests and your system. So imagine you have this website over here and you want to find out what the top story heading is. Now, there are a number of ways you could do that. One is you could bring up a Selenium instance, you could connect go, and, and insert some export expression and, and, and pull out the information that you need. But if you put an interface in between the page object, which implements a method which says stop story heading, which actually does this for you, um, it's great because you can reuse code, and it makes things more maintainable at the end of the day. Uh, so we have a really creative group of designers who occasionally wake up one morning and say, you know, we have this really great idea. Let, let's move things around. You know, let's change the layout of the site. And, and if you have a library of hundreds of tests, you know, they're all likely to break. So all you need to do with use page objects is just, you know, update the page object and, and things will keep working. Uh, we've also extended this concept to, to win, I apologize for this slide, it makes me feel like I want to throw up sometimes. But basically, we've also adapted it to, to Windows, uh, to .NET applications. So we've built uh, a page object model around the tool which journalists use to upload stories to the site. And you know when you when you delve into the detail of of page objects, um, you know now you're you're really in, in engineering territory. So this is something which which software engineers take over. You know they could be developers, they could be people in the testing team who are software engineers in test. Um, but this is something which is purely out of the comfort zone of analysts. We have had instances. There is this simple method down here: click button save whereby a test analyst is so, so eager to see his test working that he noticed that method and just copy and paste it and change save to load, for example, and see if it works. You know, and most of the time it will, and if not, he'll just pull someone over and he'll get it fixed there and then. 
So this has put us in a situation whereby we have this, this abstraction layer, this abstraction approach, where people are working on the same task. So we're all working towards a common goal of automating tests for one project. Okay, so it's not analysts writing tests in Microsoft Word or in, or in Excel, and then engineers reading those off and implementing them, right? So we're actually writing executable code written by analysts. And what's more, they're doing something they enjoy. So whilst they're doing this, they're thinking about test cases, they're thinking about vulnerability value analysis, if need be, they're thinking about equivalence classes. So it's something they enjoy doing. And as you, as you move down into the shades of gray, you eventually end down in pure engineering territory when people are talking about variables, loops, you know, classes, inheritance, and so on. And things with, which make analysts yawn at the end of the day. Uh, so I've been saying that I stereotype a lot. So the, I've been saying, you know, there are engineers and there are analysts. But using this approach, uh, you can always have, you can also have people who, are, who sometimes float in between. Okay, and they're really motivated to do everything. And those people fit in here as well. So they, you can put them in at any stage in the project and either to create some cucumber scripts or wire in some, some tests. Um, okay. Yeah, this is just a slide I put in there just to show you that it can start, get, start to get a bit more complex if you need it to. So this is a test from our suite of tests for the weather site. And basically, it's a parameterized test, right? So we can, this test basically looks for a number of post, for weather in a number of postcodes. And the tests are involved. Just put in parameters and then give a number of examples for each parameter. And Cucumber will actually spawn this out into multiple tests. So on, on a technical level, that's where we've got to so far. Uh, we're not really looking into integration testing right now. That's a bit more complex, but it's only being a year, and we're just, you know, dealing with end-to-end -end tests. Uh, we've also found the need to, to think about process. Okay, so it's one thing to send people off to a training course. It's another thing to get them down and trying out a few examples. And, you know, it's a completely different thing to commit them to a project and asking them to, to produce or make a test as a team. And to be honest, I'm not going to stand here and lecture you about process. You know, sometimes process decisions are, are specific to your particular scenarios. I'm just going to go over some generic topics. So this is a figure I pulled out of a, a book called Legend Testing. And basically, it outlines the different types of tests you carry, you carry out during a project. And one of the dangers I was afraid of was that we'd be so immersed in the automated testing side of things that that would just swallow us up. So I show this, this slide regularly to my team and tell them, okay, have, have you come up with the right strategies? Are you covering all of these, these areas? So, you know, so far we've been talking about tests which are mainly fall into the upper left quadrant, which are covering functional tests and story tests, and that's a mixture of manual and automated tests. But we, all, we also need to think about exploratory testing, for example, which is really important in our domain, and it needs to be carried out manually. And then, you know, we also need to think about performance and load testing and LET testing. So that refers to non-functional testing, security, navigability, and so on. Um, so in the context of, just in the context of automation, what's actually going on right now is, so if we take a generic project, let's take an iteration, and let's say there's a planning phase, a development phase, and a post-development phase. Uh, the tasks that are going, the activities that are going going on in these of each of these phases are so. First of all, in the planning phase, we're doing a lot of talking, right? So we're we have testers who are talking to information architects to get user journeys to to discuss what the terminology is going to be. We have testers who are talking to developers, and we've been bitten by this before. So we've we've, we've sometimes you know locked ourselves away in our quiet corners and just said, oh, okay, we're going to automate this way. And we, we sort of assume that developers would know what we're talking, would know what we're doing, and they'd magically label all the components that we need in a particular convention, and we just wire everything in. You know, when in actual fact they didn't, obviously. So, so we actually talk to developers. We set up meetings, set up labeling conventions for components, uh, any testing hooks we might need. We discuss testing approaches, and we we found them to be very cooperative. Uh, some of them actually contribute to this, so so they actually come over and volunteer to write tests sometimes. And that's really helpful. And testers are always talking, also talking amongst themselves at this point. 
remember we have different people doing different tasks within the same project. So, so basically they're just talking and saying, okay, I'm going to write the cucumber test, and then at some point I'm going to hand over to you, and you need to get this done, and so on. And ideally, by the end of the planning phase, we usually try to have a, a number of cucumber tests written, at least at the acceptance test level. Okay, and this all ties into the, the first section which we discussed, which is the defining what success looks like. Okay, and by having a cucumber test defined at this level, it means we've actually talked to product managers, we're in agreement as to, as to what they're, they're actually expecting from this product at the end of the day, and, and it gives us a focus. Okay, and it also helps developers to focus. In, in the development stage, um, we're still talking. Okay, so people are checking what user stories are in play, which ones are nearing completion, what tasks are doing, whether any testing hooks haven't been inserted. And we're doing a lot of manual testing. Okay, so with, with, while development is going on, uh, to be honest, we, we always release the first iteration of a feature doing manual testing. Because that's because the system is still, is still volatile at that point, so it's not really worth writing an automated test. And if you, do, if you test manually at this point, it's actually faster. Uh, if we have time, we do start writing some automated tests and wiring things in. Okay, but most of the time we just test manually. If it works, release. Okay, the value of automated tests to us is in the regression side of things. In the post-development phase, we're still talking, discussing what went wrong, what the high-risk areas are, what's outstanding, and at this point, what's important is we need to get all the tests automated now. So we need to get engineers in there, and they need to wire everything in. You know, we, we try to strive for zero cost regression tests, which, which is really a myth at this point, but we're trying to go towards it. And if you imagine these iterations being stacked in a sort of staircase-like fashion, at this point, the analysts have moved on to the planning phase of the next iteration. So they're creating cucumber tests for the next iteration. Um, so, so that's basically it. Uh, if I were to give you four key messages from this talk, it would be that you know, contrary to my belief, before I started working here, engineers and analysts have complementary motivations. You know, it's not some, a case of someone being superior over the other. Uh, Non-technical people can contribute to automation directly if, if you build in the right tools for them and the right motivations. And basically, we believe that this approach is actually better. So we were forced into this before because of our particular situation, but we're starting to see benefits from it, which, which I didn't see in other companies. So there were situations before whereby, you know, you'd have this really cool automated test harness set up, you release a system with being tested by hundreds of tests, and the first 10-year-old to touch the keyboard will break it. You now, mainly because the, the people involved in the project were just test engineers, and you know they had that sort of training motivational curve, and they paid too much attention to the technical side of their work and not enough attention to the strategizing point of that work. And one thing that's become painfully obvious is you know, invest time and effort in communication. So be it within your testing team itself, being talking to developers because you need their, their help in automation. And there are loads of questions we need to, which need to be asked beforehand, such as, you know, what happens if a test breaks? Who's going to fix it in this scenario? You know, and you need to set up all these processes. So communication is really important. Um, so so that's, that's basically it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be happy to take them. That's it. Thank you. Uh, when I saw uh, that uh, example of cucumber test, uh, written in uh, so uh, a little bit human speaking language, uh, I'm immediately think uh, that is uh, another test. In fact, that is uh, requirement. Yes. Sorry. It is requirement. Basically, yes. Uh, and, and not so, so you're saying that the, the cucumber test actually doubles for a requirement? Uh, why doubles? Sorry? Uh, no, 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 it's not double requirements. A requirement is when I am from outside UK, I should be somewhere. Exactly. Yes? yes. Uh, and that's the thing uh, which should be uh, uh, fixed, uh, written, uh, and uh, uh, agreed by uh, 
the whole team maybe uh, before uh, we start development at all. Yes? Yes. Uh, so uh, it's a good place to store your requirements uh, before starting uh, development and before starting testing. Yes? Okay. And uh, that means uh, you can have uh, your requirements easily converted uh, to tests uh, before uh, in the time when you uh, start um, maybe mocking, maybe prototyping ob objects uh, and uh, when uh, development uh, is not completely ended uh, you can have uh, a lot of tests uh, already uh, automated. Yes. It isn't? So so you can have a lot of tests already automated if you set up the, the right the right communication in advance. So if you need to click on a button somewhere, then you need to assume that that button is going to have a particular ID, for example. Just take a simple simple example. Um, so yes, in theory, that should happen. We're not at that stage yet. So in many cases, we're, we're, we're tied up a lot with multiple projects. So we deal with a number, I believe we have something like 60 engineers, and the testing team varies between 7 and 12 because we bring in some temporary workers sometimes. Uh, so, so we're not really in that situation yet. But, but yes, theoretically, you should be able to do it. Mine, mine is a combination of, uh, of a question and a comment. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for presenting this, because you've basically given real-life validation and blueprint of something that I've been trying to put in place for the last one year. So. As a follow-up, I might bug you and maybe ask you a favor to fly out to Dubai, come to my company, and give this one more time. Because <laughs> I've been trying to convince them that it is possible for us to get to automate things without necessarily having to bring a whole new team of automators and you know utilize what we already have in place. Second one is uh, following up on uh, Timor's about using Cucumber. I've, I just thought the same thing that he did because you can you can do two things. You can clean up your requirements, which is a big problem with uh, getting people to automate. Analysts talk about one thing, developers talk about something else, and there's a, there's a gap in between. This is helping to bridge that. My question is, how, how did you get this whole conversation started? Because I've been banging my head against the wall for the longest time to try and show people that there's a common ground and we, we will be able to actually use it. Is there, are there any tips you can give me other than me flying you out to Dubai and saying, Look, <laughs> here, here's a guy who's doing, you know, exactly what I'm talking about for, exactly. And the <laughs> fact that it's the BBC, you know, case yeah. closed in my opinion. So right. in many cases, it's just a matter of persistence and just being the, the annoying person who's constantly bothering your line managers and saying, well, we should be doing this, we should be doing this. You know. It took a year to get this point, which, to be honest, is not really very far. So there's only so much you can do using Cucumber. Because once you start getting into the finer level of detail, let's say you want to you know, test individual components instead of just end-to-end -end stuff. You know, how, how are we going to achieve that? You know, so, so it's a huge challenge. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. But we just perceive this as the, the thing that would give us most value in the quickest way, basically. And how we chose the technologies that we did. It was mainly experimentation and lots of research. And then someone just yanks your chain and says, you know, make a decision. And just say, OK, Ruby, Cucumber, <laughs> and let's go for it. You know, you have to act. Uh, if I can, well, I have a few ideas or maybe a few guesses on how things are done. Um, let, me, let me ask a question that goes up a level above those tests. You don't get your requirements in Cucumber. You, you don't get them in, in that form. You need to write the Cucumber script. Yes. How do you trace back to your requirements? So that's a tricky question because yeah. every, every project has its own way of working. So they don't, they don't only get to choose their technologies, they get to choose their processes as well. And so the tendency is that we use tools like Mingle, for example, which actually organizes your user stories. and or, or even if we, use, if we write stories in Word, there's a section at the bottom which says, you know, what are your acceptance tests? And in many cases, you know, Cucumber doesn't really have its own syntax. That's the way user stories should be, acceptance tests should be written. So they, they're focused on the value which the user story will deliver, 
they're focused on the preconditions and you know what should happen and and that's it. So at most, the traceability is usually just a, a case of syntax. So so you might have an argument there which says you know we should just start writing requirements in cucumber. It should start com just come from there, which I, I think is is part of the mantra of behavior during the well, the behavior during development anyway. Well, the basic argument is that you only need you only want to change in one place and not in two because yeah. sooner or later they're gonna they're gonna go apart and you're gonna have inconsistencies between yes. either your test case or your requirement. So the only problem over there is that with a user story you don't you don't just usually get that. So you might get design outlines, uh, wireframes, and so on. So there's a lot of information which goes into every feature. You know, so a cucumber can't store that. It's impossible. Okay. And what's the cost of it all this? In what do you mean by cost? I mean to go from your requirement to a cucumber script to integrate it into your continuous integration system okay. and using it for regressions, like thumbs number. So so there's this thing called an automation hump. I don't know whether you've heard of it. So if, if you map out the effort you need to go through when you're just starting out automating, you know, it's, there's a, a huge lot of effort in the beginning. And just until you build up a critical mass of expertise and, and methodologies and, and tools and so on. And we're currently in the very steep part of that. So we've done a lot of work, but but it's still slow moving. So the cost right now is very high. At some point, you reach the point where you have enough enough libraries in place and enough trained up people, and it'll start becoming practically free, you know, but cheap. Yeah, the, long, the longer the project, the more you get. Yeah. And, and remember, we work on, on a limited number of sites, so most of the things we do can be reused, you know, in future as well. So the concept of having stories will never change for us. Right? So, so we can reuse that. Um, all right, we, we've done. Not quite, not quite as effectively, but we've done similar things with FITS, you know, which is the previous generation. And um, one of the things we found was important is to distinguish between FIT as, or, you know, in this case, um, Cucumber as um, uh, describing requirements and then proper testing. Because yeah. I find if you put the two together, you end up with this, this boat anchor with this, this, these incredibly detailed specs that you can't change the, the slightest thing without the whole thing falling over. Okay. So I was wondering if you had any comparable experience yet. No, we haven't. So we're still at the point where we are, we're automating acceptance tests yeah. on, on, a, on a really high level. So luckily, uh, the, the domain in which you work doesn't really lend itself to a lot of you know, data boundary analysis, for example. So we don't really have complex inputs. Yeah. So it works for us. So if you had a complex form, for example, I can't imagine that being automated in, in Cucumber. That's something where you need to bring, bring in engineers or, or find another solution to it. No, but we don't really, we haven't really come across that yet. Yeah, hi. Um, you mentioned during the talk that you're not writing the tests along with the code. You're writing the tests. You're only doing regression tests. You're only doing this automated system yeah. for regression test purposes. Um, how are you dealing with? Um, you're able. You're obviously able to produce more features more quickly than you can write tests to cover those features. And I'm interested to know how you came to the conclusion that testing features as they're released manually is quicker than, than, than writing the tests for them as you develop the features. So, so, so yes, yeah, so, so it's quicker from a stakeholder's point of view, right? Because if someone is waiting for a system to be developed and developers say, we're done and it's just in testing, and we're saying, you know, we're not done. We need to write automated tests first. You know, from a stakeholder's point of view, it's quicker if we just test it manually and get it done. Um, so your question is more to do with. So if I, if I understood your question correctly, is do we find that it would get to the point where the backlog is so large that, you know, we can't deal with it anymore? So I have to. Re I'm sorry, I have to repeat this, but we, we really haven't been in this situation for so long. So. Most of this matured, matured over the past two or three months. So we, we're actually try, we've actually tried out on small scale projects. And only now we're just starting it up on a really huge project, which is a project leading up to a release of a major relaunch of the site next, next year. 
and we we we, we hopefully hopefully it will work uh, but we'll have more results next year basically this is we're still in pioneer territory here for for our particular context Do you have a link be between the requirement requirements specified in Cucumber and the extra code? So if later you if you have some bug in the code, can you go back to the requirement? Or the other way around, if you know a specific requirement, can you can you know which pieces of code is related to this or implementing this requirement? So that's very interesting. So, so you're saying if something goes wrong in, in a particular line of code, right. can we just trace it back to requirement 10? Right. Uh, no. I'm, I'm sure you can in some way, maybe combining it with your source control tool and putting some sort of process in place. But so far, those two things live in different worlds, literally. OK. Uh, I have a question about the reliability of the tests. When you and <clears throat> sorry, uh, how reliable do you find these tests? Like, if you run them lots of times, do you spend a lot of time having to fix them up? So on the website side of things, yes, they're very reliable because most of the time we're checking user journeys, we're checking the functionality of some limited dynamic aspects. Uh, there really isn't much that can go wrong over there, and unless you know, no. Most of the time, we have this static site in place with some dynamic components. So yes, we find them very reliable. You know, we, we found that to work. Um, on the .NET side of things, we're, we're, we're still learning from that. So the developers in that particular team aren't really used to test automation. So they tend to change things around without thinking about testing and things will break. You know, and one of the problems we've encountered is once you have a non-technical person working on this now, and he goes, all of a sudden sees a stack trace. You know, how, how does he know what to do? You know, so, so that's something we're dealing with. But on the website side of things, you know, that's, they never break. OK, yeah, so kind of a follow-up question on that. So when the website layout changes, uh, how do you deal with the changes to the required changes to the web objects, uh, sorry, page objects? Uh, do you have some uh, normal TDD practices there? Uh, do you ever run a regression suit just for the page um, objects or? So what you do is you, you ask an engineer to look at it and they just fix it there and then. OK. And so it's what, essentially something that's breaks that's, and then, that's then just. process for us. Yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah. Debug it until it works. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, but usually we know in advance because our design team have really solid processes in place and we have wireframes way in advance of the change. Uh, how do you test flash-related objects? Do you have any particular tool? Yes, it's called the manual tester. So, <laughs> okay. so, so, <laughs> so, so I've looked into this. There is a way which you could test objects, flash objects with Selenium. I haven't really managed to do this yet. I mean, I've seen an example online which basically involves changing colors on a box or something. But I've yet to, to use it on, on our video player, for example. Um, the problem is that when, when it comes to our flash objects, they're usually things like video players and you know moving weather maps which you know aside from checking that the play button works i don't really know what else you can do you know to verify that the video is playing correctly you know so we haven't really really gotten to that point yet but it's definitely something we're going to, we're going to explore in the future Uh, did I take it right that on before starting the automation project, you uh, decided about the criteria of of this uh, for the success of uh, automation in general? Did that so so the pro that? the project in general, not just automation, yeah. but mm -hmm. the stakeholders usually get together and say, you know, at the end of this project, we need people to be able to follow Formula One online, for example. And these particular scenarios should be able to happen. And as a testing team, we try and say, okay, and. From our point of view, this this would result in fifty percent, you know, regression tests in place and so on. Um, yes, and that's all. So, um, in other words, how do you understand that your uh, automation efforts are effective, uh, considering the maintenance efforts, things like that? So, so I'm going to keep pulling this card out of my hat, but this is really new for us. So right now, going from zero to having 
one automated test is huge, you know? So, so we're really not at a point yet where we can say we have hundreds of tests and the, the site has been changing for the past few months and this, you know, we've been maintaining it or everything's falling apart. You know, we've picked a, sit we've picked a set of tools and a process which we, we think will work for us. Um, we've yet to pr be proven right or wrong. So this has literally matured in the past few weeks. So we were just starting to use it out in practice. And another question that also already has been uh, formulated a few times, but uh, once again, uh, what about the uh, changes of the design? Uh -huh. uh, the page elements uh, change their location and uh, the scenarios changes. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, did I take it right that you mentioned uh, that you somehow uh, organized your tests so that uh, be prepared to such changes? You, is that right? And what, what exactly, how you design the tests so that uh, so, minimize so the eff effect on, the, on okay. the tests? So we do this through page objects, right? And so there, there's a considerable amount of time that has to pass between a designer having an idea and that idea being deployed live to the website. So let's say we have a, a method which uh, the, the, you know, there's the third method it's called other top stories, which basically returns an array of, of all the, top, the other top stories section on the site, which is this area right over here. Okay, so right now that might involve querying, querying the page for a particular export location and then looking for particular child elements and formulating an array. Now, if a designer were tomorrow morning to say, we're gonna change those other stories and we're gonna have them horizontally across the top of the page, uh, we, we'd first get wireframes, and then there's actually a process which calls the user testing where we actually go to the public and take a sample and say, you know, do, do you prefer this over that? So there's a whole process here. We eventually get our wireframes, and by the time developers get around to implementing it, we'd, be, we'd already have changed them. So we've not have re actually been in the situation yet, but I'm, I'm not worried about it as well. It'll work. Uh, at the start, you said about, um, say, it would be a disaster if in the middle of the Formula One or the World Cup, the, um, it just dropped altogether. All these tests are really automated functional tests. Yes. I wonder if you had any um, automated non-functional tests That's for it. load or performance or no. general plans. So, so right now, w the things like... Um, Performance testing, security testing, that's carried out by, by architects. And it's also, we also hedge against it using infrastructure. So for example, when it comes to live streams, we actually outsource to content delivery networks like Akamai or something like that. So at that point, we, we've actually pushed the responsibility out to them and, or, and their minimum level of service. You know, so, so that's a way with which we deal with it. And even, you know, websites are not the, are, are usually hosted in, on multiple server farms across the UK. So it's not something that really worries us a lot, but there are system architects who actually look at that. 